this. Let's see if we can get this um, all this audio gear cranking and working. Oh, hey, how you going? So, yep, that's Michael. I'm Emma, and we are from Objective Secured. Just in case you happen to be on our Facebook page and didn't realise that's who we are. <laughs> Let's see if I can um, get some audio happening here for me. Hopefully you can all hear me now. I can certainly hear me. You'll have to excuse the headset while I figure out all the um, channel stuff. But I think we're good. I think. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how we go. Someone will tell us if our mouth's moving and nothing's coming out. Well, hopefully. All right. So, um, yeah, we're tuning in for another, basically just a chat. We just like hearing the sound of our own voices. Wednesday night live chats. Yeah. Fortnightly but Wednesday night live chats. It's happening two fortnights in a row. Huh? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. Hopefully everyone can hear us. It looks like they can hear us now. Can you hear our dog in the background? He's apparently not happy with the world. All right. Um, we asked for people earlier in the week to send through some um, some suggestions for what we can talk about tonight. And Emma's got the iPad there, so we figured we might um, might cover a few of them. And um, we might as well just start at the top and work our way down, I guess. Okay. So the first question we've got is where do we oh, get the idea? Hang on. I just thought of something else we have to cover first. Oh, what do we have to cover first? Well, um, the first game for our YouTube channel will go up on Friday. Yes. Um, it's a little bit late because the software doesn't <laughs> like me. A week late. <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to the podcast last week, you'll have heard us talking about it. Apparently, my dogs really don't like something out there. Um, we we spent a lot of time recording it. We had uh, local hobbyist Gillian Platel come out and have a game. And then, well tech teething issues and she beat him she's not so no you don't oh no she didn't what did you do that for you're spoiling the ending well, as no because well. now they don't know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we oh um we recorded that and then the file turned out to be significantly larger than i'd expected nearly 20 gig worth of video so then um it's taken a bit of editing to try and actually get the software to deal with it and now that i have i think i can hit upload on thursday night so it should be there friday morning on the youtube channel if you want to go and check it out it's a full unedited two-hour game though and the audio is not perfect, sadly. We're working on it. We're getting there, baby steps. I've actually got a um, a guy I met. Uh, his name's Hugh. Over um, when I did Genghis Khan a couple of weeks back, who's offered to help us out with some of the audio and video stuff. So hopefully that means that um, once he and I have had a chat, we can fix some of the issues we've been having. Sort out some of the teething problems. Yeah. Um, I should also very quickly put a shout out to the guys at Crags who hosted their first annual 40k event for 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, unending battle lines down in Quinana on Sunday, just gone. 1,500 points one day, four games. Um, they had 34 players, I think it was. So you said 30, tell me 32. Somewhere in the 32, 34, 30, 36, 30 something. something yeah. um, which was great to see. A um, bunch of new armies and some old returning players as well, which was awesome. Um, so, yeah, I had a good day. I know that um, everyone I spoke to had a good day as well. And Dave took out the... Overall win? Yeah, Sly Dave, um, who we've um, spoken to in the past, and uh, we actually recorded the game with him as well. Mm -hmm. And he's a returning player for 40K 8th edition. He played, he and I used to play all the time back in 4th edition. Yeah, 4th. And uh, he's had a few years off with career and family and everything. So now he's come back in and started playing, and he was the one who was playing the Scorpion, if you were there on the weekend. So um, He was the one who walked away with the medal that said winner on the weekend if you were there. Yeah, but the, <laughs> there, were, there were plenty of people who didn't hang around at the end. So um, if you saw the giant Eldar Scorpion Super Heavy Grave Tank flying around, that was his army. So what well on Dave. Um, I think Dean Langford took away Best General and Aaron Jaws Angry Marines took out Best Painted, which um, if you want to check out Aaron's army, it's on the website, objectivesecure.com.au, um, for the spotlight of all the, the Angry Marines that he did. So... Um, I think that covers everything at the moment, though. So, shall we? Um, shall we now start with the actual questions? Sure. One moment. Yes, Alan, you should remember that it was very painful for you. Alan, oh. Alan um, took the record for the day of how many wounds Dave could do with the scorpion in a single shooting phase. It was fifty-one wounds. It was in a single shot. I'm not sure that Alan wants that record. Remembering or oh, publicising. It's too late now. But, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, okay, so we've got a question from Selby, which is, where do you get the ideas for the restrictions that are placed on army lists for tournaments? For example, first blood, we didn't allow armies to use Chaos, Imperium, 
um, etc. keywords, but upcoming WATC doesn't have this restriction and no team can use the same codex for more than once per team. Just wondering, how do you come up with different variations for two different tournaments? Is this based off things you see interstate, international tournaments? Is there a secret tournament organizer's handbook or do you just like trying different ideas and seeing how they work? Yes. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, it's a very sort of lengthy question. Um, where do we get the ideas from? Uh, look, I'm going to shamelessly admit to stealing some from around the country. It's um, not stealing. It's informed eclecticism. Okay. It's borrowing bits and pieces that work for other people. And Well, if we start the, like if you look at our standard calendar, so First Blood, when we first ran First Blood, it was a No Allies 7th edition um, starter event. And we've tried to keep that theme each year we've run it. So yeah. First Blood for this year, to keep that first single army kind of kickoff event, the reason we took away all the chaos and soup keywords like uh, Imperium and... Um, Eldari and some of those sort of words that let you combine different codexes was to keep the same feel that we wanted to set for that event and two or three about years ago. It being a starter event. Yeah, so mono, mono codex and obviously a year from now when we've got all the codexes it'll be easier because we're not worrying about indexes and that sort of thing. But um, it's, it's designed to be, hey, I got these stuff for Christmas or um, it's a new army that I want to do for this year and it's a small single faction army to be able to build on through yeah. the year there were a couple of guys who um were a bit disappointed with the format who reached out and had a chat to them about it and, and kind of explained this to them one of the guys had a really cool inquisition army that he planned that required the imperium keyword to do about three different armies and like i said to him if i allow it for him because he's got a cool theme and everything i'd love to allow it but the second you allow it you have to then consider what everyone else is going to do with that so unfortunately it's um the needs of the many <laughs> and we put it out for that for a reason. So yeah. it's not necessarily about the needs of the, of the many. It's about making that once you publish it, it then we have to stay that way because yeah. it's about it being fair and equitable. So that's the first event. Line Breaker is a very traditional tournament format. Um, the main difference being it's in Albany. Um, it's a great road trip. We've got that in about four weeks' time. Yeah. Um, which is a, a great weekend. You drive down Friday night, you play Saturday, you drive home Sunday and you drink a copious amount of alcohol. You do not have to drink alcohol. If you come along and you don't drink, that's completely fine. It is completely no fine. No one will make fun of you much. Well, no, Sam, Sam, <laughs> Sam won't be there. So, yeah. um, But no, so that event was a very traditional format, but we were using the ETC-style missions for that to try and get the Albany guys used to some of the more complex missions that we play in Perth. And they seem to have... You know, taken to that. So this year we've lifted some of the restrictions for the games down there and we've upped the point slightly as well. Yeah, so in the past that event has had more restrictions on it because um, some of the guys from down in Albany had some concerns around what Perth players um, might be like and what kind of lists they might bring and how, um, I guess... I guess what tournament players are like. Yeah, you, and... re you read a lot on the internet and you've just got to be mindful of that. And I think they were concerned that the Perth players were just going to come down and ruin their... Um, their community yeah. by just smashing everyone. Yeah, that's it. So, um, so traditionally, well, traditionally for the last two years, it's had more restrictions. But this year, the Albany guys all know the Perth people um, a little bit yeah, better. There's a little and, more trust there now that yeah. we're all there for the same reason, not just a. So it's cool to be able to lift some of those yeah. restrictions. Um, so that's been really positive. Then WATC, WATC started its life when. Uh, so 2012 was the first time I went to the ETC as part of the Australian team. Now, the first ATC was eight years ago. Yeah, this is the uh, 2018 will be the eighth consecutive ATC. So we must have done the first ATC in 2011 and then done the first ETC 2012. But ETC has obviously been running a lot longer than that. So the ETC, for those not aware of it, is the European Team Challenge. And it's based in, it moves around in, in Europe and basically the Australians poached it. So we do the ATC, the Australian Team Challenge. Um, it's just been renamed, if you're looking for it online, it's the ANZ um, Team Challenge because we're incorporating, we have New Zealand returning for the first time in a couple of years this year, which is awesome. And it's um, teams of eight in the ETC and the ATC. So the first year we ran WATC, it was teams of four. And that kind of worked and kind of didn't because we were trying to give the Perth players a taste of what those team events are like, because they do play the game, they make the game very different. 
and the camaraderie and some of the tactics that go into the team matchup process is something that we wanted to expose them to as well. And I think the teams of four worked for the first event because it's much easier to find three other players yeah. that play a different army than you do. Whereas when, you know, last year we had some concerns over how people would go coming up with six different players to put in one team that didn't share any of those same armies. Yeah, and we had um, uh, 12 teams of six last year. This year looks like it's going to be even bigger. We're looking because between... we're aiming for eighteen. Okay, um, I know of about a dozen teams so far that have kind of gotten in touch and said, "Hey, we're getting involved." Um, this year's yeah, definitely looking like it's going to be pushing closer to a hundred players than seventy, which is great. Um, what it does do is exposes everyone and gives that that taste of team events and that format from uh, etc to atc to watc. The missions are very similar. The limits are very similar. The only difference between the WATC and the ATC is the points values dropped. And because we dropped the points value and we're trying to do it all in one day rather than two, we only do four games. We do 1,500 points, not 2,000 instead of six. So so I think getting to Selby's point, why do we have it that you can't, that each team member needs to have a different army? So the, that, uh, that original limit, to my, the best of my knowledge from the time I've spent in that sort of team environment, stems from the concerns of players, six players rocking up with six Elder Armies or six players rocking up with six Space Marine Armies or six players rocking up with the same copy-pasted, copy-pasted armies. Okay, we're not looking at anyone, but the Armadale boys and JD who all turned up to the event Masters with... with Necrons. Yeah, with the, with the exact same list. Same list. This that, could be you. That's the reason. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's it, because part of the interesting part about the ATC and the, the WATC and those sorts of formats is the matchup process. If you haven't seen the way the matchups work for 2018, you can jump on our YouTube channel. There's a matchup process that we recorded last year for the 2017 event. The format's still the same. So um, you can check that out. But basically, it, it gives you the opportunity to pick and choose who plays who to some okay. degree. I just need to interrupt. New rule. If you're giving an angry face, you need to give me a reason why there's an angry face. Okay? We, so I can... We've got a screen just off camera here, so we can see all the angry faces. We can faces see the angry stuff. faces, but I don't know why there's an angry face. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a it's about creating some uh, another level of tactics within the game. So you've got the obviously the the game that you're playing, and then you've got the matchup process that, that sits above that. And then we, because we publish all the lists about two weeks out, you actually get a couple of weeks to kind of analyze them and throw them around within the team environment to kind of see who can. Oh, you know, I didn't expect to have to deal with that. Please don't match me up with that. Those sorts of things. Or oh my god, I'll smash that list. Um, so it's it's a cool, fun format. It is a competitive format. I had someone question me at Unending Battle Lines at Crags about the painting. They made a, a flippant comment saying, oh, you know, there's no painting. Ha, ha, ha. No, there is. There's no painting score, but you have to have you a painting still have model. To, that's it. You still have to abide by the Bill of Rights that we have, which yeah. states that you need to have a painted army on the table. And if you don't, then your opponent has every right to ask you to remove that table. Yeah. That a model from the table. So the captains this year are going to be expected to police that fairly strictly and stringently. And if the opposing captain then makes the call and says, no, that model's not painted, then yeah, there's there's going to be models being removed. So you have to make sure your models have the minimum standards on them. I've got a, a grab from the Warhammer World minimum standards that they use, which I'll put up on the um, Facebook page and on the website and so on. Um, it's a really good kind of baseline that they use. It's probably higher than the baseline that we set at the moment. Yeah, um, here's my hint. If you can um, cut your models off the sprue before you arrive to the yeah. WATC event, yeah. if you can glue your models onto the bases before you arrive at the event, if you can undercoat them before you arrive at the event and stick some paint on them before you arrive at the event, you're going to be in a much better position than some of the players were last year. Yeah. Don't buy, <laughs> don't buy your army 24 hours before and try and build it and paint it. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It was great seeing the teamwork as they all sat there in the um, little at foyer area, morning, yeah. cutting everything off and gluing it and taking it outside and spray painting it and, you know, awesome teamwork, but probably not the best idea. No. Um, so, yeah, the, the format there for WATC is, is all about recreating the larger team events from around the country. I know the American version slightly different again, and we had ATC before they did. They keep calling theirs the ATC. It's bloody the Australian one. Except so, we don't have ATC anymore, no, so they can have it. They should have changed we've got it. New we Zealand. had it first. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that's that's kind of where WATC comes from. It's it's an effort for us to give that team format 
back to the players of Perth because it's a great format. It's a really fun day. Um, win, lose, or draw. It's nice to win, of course, but um, you know, it's it's a cool event because it does mean that there's a lot of tactics that go in outside of that. Um, I don't know. Some captains just go, yeah, you know, like they, they're a bit flippant with the matchups. There's some that take it very seriously. So, you know. Yeah, I think um, one of the questions further down the page was around how is a um, how's a team event different to a single player event. And how can you, I guess, approach getting ready and preparing for a single player? How does it differ when you're getting ready and preparing for a single player event compared to a team event? And one of the things that I think is probably really important to remember is that when you're playing in a team event, it's about the good of the team rather than it being about a single player getting the most number of wins. So often um, we've joked about having stickers made up that says, I got thrown under the bus. We had them made one year. Yeah, we did. And that was, well, that was when you went over to, was that ETC or ATC you took those? Uh, I think that was Hobart. So ATC, was Hobart. yeah. She's trying to read off the screen, people. It's never going to happen. Um, but yeah. The, it's a uh, long way away and the writing's very small. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the, the, the good of the, the, if the, one of the players has to take a bad matchup so that everyone else gets good matchups. Yeah. Then you're to more likely drop to win the one round. game as opposed to yeah yeah. So if you go and check out the matchup process first, that's probably the, the best place to start. If you look at the um, score sheet as well, you'll very quickly see how you win the round. If you go to the back of the players pack, there's the score sheet because there's a players pack, and that's on the website. And if you look at the on players the pack. Tab. Before you turn up to the event, that's also a good idea. Yep, it'll give you all four missions. Oh, tonight's all about the tips, people. <laughs> so it'll give you all four missions. It'll give you the scoring system, so that it's uh, another twenty zero um, um, sort of sliding scale differential that we use fairly standard for over the last couple of years. But then you add all those scores together, and there's a scale for the team, so you can win, lose, or draw for the team. And once you've figured that out, then you can obviously look at, okay, well, we need to win this many games by this many points in order to win the round. Yeah. And then you can start looking at, once you've got the lists in hand, you can look at the other other teams and go, oh, okay, well, if we, if we play them, we can't beat that list. But if we can get these other matchups, yeah. then I can, you know, you can, you can still win the round. And it's about saying, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to go for the 20-0 win. No. You can go for, um, you know. it's 12. 11 or 12 points a player wins the round. Mm. Um, so obviously, if you can get a couple of 20 zeros, then it's, it makes the, the rest of the team's life much easier. Yeah. But um, I know when you go to eight players, you need 86 points. I think for this, I think it's 65 or 64 points. It's, like, it's around sort of that 11 points a player. It's on the um, score sheet, though. So it's very easy to figure that out. Um, so that's WATC. Then we do mixed doubles later in the year which um, kind of followed the First Blood format around it being a more casual event. Um, that player's pack's a little bit in flux at the moment because of 8th edition, and we played the last one in 7th, so I've got to try and figure out how that's all going to link together. Yeah, so the idea was... Oh, no, we, did. we played it in 8th. We did play it in 8th. Yeah, we did. Um, the idea with the mixed doubles is obviously that it's supposed to be mixed doubles, so um, having male and female partners, not necessarily no, we... partners, but male and female teammates playing um but we had last year we had a father and son um and then we've had obviously two mates who turn up together that kind of thing but we wanted to create a really friendly relaxed atmosphere so that women who were perhaps reluctant to um to kind of check out the tournament scene might feel a little bit more comfortable coming to an event like that where they've got someone with them that they know and you know where it is really designed to invite women into that space. So it's designed to be a great big hug. Just to... Don't hug me. Just don't. <laughs> um, so, yeah, mixed, mixed doubles is another very casual format. Um, the show event for 2018 is going to have oh, at least four different 40K events. I don't even want to talk about it. It's just too big. It's um, just getting bigger every day. If you are, I do want to talk about it. It's so exciting. You should definitely come. If you're not aware, um, WA won the bid for the ATC event for 2018, which is awesome. It's only taken eight years, but we are bringing it to Perth. We're also looking at New Zealand turning up and all of you know, We're basically going to have everyone but Tasmania turn up. So we've kind of got a Merc team in the background getting ready as well, just as a backup. 
And so that'll be either six or eight teams of eight happening over two days at show. And then alongside that, we'll have three one-day 40K events as well. And each one of those will be slightly different. Uh, the only thing we're going to guarantee is that on day three, we're going to do last blood, which is essentially a, um, a slightly modified first blood because um, that was crazy. So, okay. You've jabbered on, but you haven't actually answered the question as to where you come up with the ideas. I'm, I'm for just the... going through them all first. Oh, my God. How long does it take? Yeah, the we've got lots of different events. The last event is Masters. Masters it's Masters. Is... It's the big one. There we go. Done it. Is the most competitive event. It's, again, based off of the National Masters system. 17th and 18th of November. She didn't know earlier when I asked the question about No, dates. I didn't know about doubles. Far out. Anyway, um, so a lot of it's us trying to give WA players that um, experience of a lot of the national and international events. Um, some of them are geared towards community building and to new army developments. Um, and then, you know, they're also, some of them are just for fun. Like they're just, the missions change because I, I play different missions or we play just different missions and, I've got a group of people that I send them out to and go, hey, play this. And people send them back to me going, oh, my God, don't do that. Or, oh, that was amazing fun. And we just circulate, circulate those in and out just to kind of mix it up a little bit. Yeah. And I think um, as to why do we have different restrictions and why do we have different, why are the events all different? It's because what we find is that the players who are coming, different players want different things. Yeah. So we're trying to, I guess, cater for as many people as possible because we want to make the game um, – we want to make it accessible for as many people as possible. But we also want the people who are coming to every event, I'm imagining that it's quite boring to play the same event once a month, whereas if we can mix it up a little bit, then it just makes things a bit more interesting. It also means that we're in, the, in a position to work with some of the gaming clubs when we know that they're running a certain style of event that we can work and make sure that there's a variety within the community as you go through the year so that you're not, like Emma says, just playing the same thing again and again and again, which if you go back to the early 2000s was pretty much what was happening. Um, the event format didn't really change apart from it being one day or two. So we're, we're deliberately trying to make it a bit interesting in, in what we're doing so that when the clubs start doing their own unique things, no one's kind of just rinsing and repeating the same things. And the best part about it is these days that the clubs and us share a very good relationship so that when they start running events and when we're running events, there's a, a bit of mutual conversation around like moving dates and making sure that there's no conflicts so um which is what happened with crags and um some of the early events that we were running because we were meant to have our first first blood first blood was supposed to be last weekend yeah a weekend before last weekend yeah the last weekend that they've just held their 40k event on yeah so um yeah, the, the, where do we get the ideas apparently from? apparently somebody needed to get married and by the way yeah. congratulations dion and nikki yeah. um so, yeah, most of our ideas are either stolen from international interstate events or they are products of me playing games and testing them out and going, hey, this would be cool to try in a tournament. So that's kind of where all the, the formats come from. Yeah. Um, and we, we do try and stick as close as we can to the rule book where we can. Um, the only thing we really change these days is the, the way the missions are scored um, using the differential to turn it into a 20-0. And that's yeah. purely to even the scores out because there's nothing worse than playing a, a game scoring 35 points in the first game and then just being so far in front for the rest of the tournament that, you know, you, no one else can catch Especially up. Especially uncatchable, yeah. So the the twenty zero differential scale is there purely to make sure that everyone has the same access to the same amount of points. Um, and then obviously how much you win by will determine how many of those points you actually get. And that's worked really well for the last three and a half years, three years, three and a yeah, half years. Yeah, and I certainly found that that worked better than the way... Um, the way that the LVO worked when you were playing it, oh, where the, it was the ITC th format, yeah, yeah, with the thousand points for the win, and oh no, look, those those are still really good for strength of schedule, yeah, but um, I think you know that that guarantees that if you've got two people tied up, you've got a count back system, which is fine, and it guarantees that the person who um, the person who wins the most games. Wins the event. Win, at least wins generalship, yeah. Yeah, which is not necessarily how it works out with the way that we run our scoring. Well, no, the um, I remember the first, was it the first Masters we did, there were plenty of people actually who said, hang on a minute, I won five of my six games. 
this person only won four of their games, but they but they scored they, higher they than I did. They finished higher than me because yeah. the guy who won four games went twenty zero, twenty zero, twenty zero, twenty zero, and then the two losses were like eleven nine losses. Yeah, and the whereas other the guy who won five was five twelve, 12 eight. eight. Yeah, and then the loss was like an eighteen two loss. So the 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 person who had four wins. If anyone's good at maths, you can work out whether or not that actually works. It, it should work. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it meant that the person who lost more games actually ended up on a higher rank. And uh, after a lot of back and forth, we ended up deciding that it was more important that you win your games as opposed to how much you win them by. So mm. if you go six games for six, you generally win generalship. Yeah. Or four for four, or, you know, depending on how many people turn up, of course, then you start getting countbacks. But yeah, so that's kind of at its core where we start deciding on restrictions for events. That's that's where most of them have come from. I think really the restrictions depend on what we're hoping to achieve with the event that we're yeah, running. Absolutely. So if we're hoping, like First Blood, we want it to be a more friendly event, we want it to be um, a, a bit more, is casual the right word? We want it to be a bit less a bit less full on and so we have more restrictions? Look, we, we kind of let the, um, let the horse bolt this year in terms of that um, and we had a few people going, oh, you know, we were expecting it to be a bit lighter. Yeah. And... Um, I used to police the lists over past years very, very heavily and trying to keep everyone reined in. And I decided this year it was in our best interest to kind of let the community do their thing and hopefully the restrictions we had in place would be enough. Mm, and, didn't work. And it, it did to a degree. I, I think that most people regulated themselves pretty well and, and understood the intent, but um, there were a couple who didn't. And that's, um, that's good and bad for the event. Because ultimately, if you come along with one expectation and it's not what you get, then that can be a bit disappointing on the day. So um, we might have to muck about with that for 2019 or certainly for show at the end of the year. Keep talking. I'm just trying to find the <laughs> list of questions. You don't normally need any invitation to fill the space. Well, there we are with that one, folks. Um... <laughs> they all know you as well as I do. Well, that's true. Oh, this one's a really tricky one. I don't know whether or not I've got the mental capacity to have this debate and especially not live. Is this the sportsmanship one? Yeah. Would be cool to see your take as TOs on the recent happening at LVO and sportsmanship thing and how sportsmanship is scored and should it be scored differently? Is there an emotional level of perhaps losing a game and being in the mindset of, I really didn't like that player? Actually, I totally disagree with that. But anyway, we'll come back to that when it wasn't really their fault for winning the game, etc. Whereas if you win a game and have a good experience, you might be more likely to award a higher sportsmanship to your opponent because as the winner you saw they were a good sport while you won. Having heard more than one people say they're going to an event to try and win sportsmanship, can you do that? Is that an aim that can be achieved or is it too much at the whim of your opponent? Should the sportsmanship checklist should there be a sportsmanship checklist as you have for the painting scores and what would be on the checklist? <sighs> this is this is one that is, we disagree on every single event. <laughs> it, it's not even disagree on. It's that there's no <laughs> there's no good answer for it. Is the problem? Yeah. There, there's, I mean, I know that there's a few different ways that the, the rest of the world handles it. You look at um, ITC events, and it's essentially a red card, yellow card situation where we're not doing that. If uh, if someone's a jerk, you can hand them. You know, you can call a judge over and try and get them yellow carded or red carded. If someone's a jerk, call us over. We'll talk about it. We're not red carding people. These are the conversations I have. You full-on vetoed my sportsmanship checklist, okay? I'm vetoing the red card, <laughs> yellow card. Look, the, the bad part about the red card, yellow card is it's a penalty, not a, an encouragement to do the right thing. And not a conversation. Well, okay? then, Have a conversation, open up communication and go, hey, you know the what? Pro the problem with that is, though, most players, have, if, you're, if you've just tried to get someone yellow carded, you're not going to have an adult conversation. You're going to have two players that are pissed off at each other trying to sway the judge's opinion. It doesn't matter what gets said, nothing's going to be nice. There's nothing productive that comes out of that conversation. You know you just agreed with I what know. I said? Okay. I, yeah. It sounded like you were arguing with me, but I'm thinking no. you're saying the same thing that I said. <laughs> no, and, and, and that's the thing is that the red card, yellow card requires an adult conversation with two players plus a third party to intervene and say yes or no. And in the heat of the game, if you're going to try and stop a two and a half hour game to have that conversation and argument, you might as well just quit the game there and then because you're not going to finish the game. We don't agree with that either. Come and, and chat with us. Yeah, well, at, at that point, like I'm talking we'll about an, an LVO it gets scenario. To that point. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, the red card, yellow card system is a penalty. So before we do touch what we do for 
our sportsmanship and a sportsmanship checklist and what that might look like and some of the other questions. Are we going to touch on what happened to LVO and what our thoughts are? Look, L- LVO is, I mean, if you've been on the internet at all in the last, or since LVO, you'll have seen either clips of the events in question or um, you'll have heard about it. Essentially what happened is we got to the quarter f- semi-final? Semi. Semi-final. And we had two very well-known players within the community playing. And one of them, um, now not being there, not knowing context, it's hard for me to say whether it was deliberate or not. From the videos that we've seen, it looks like he's assisted his opponent in completing an action that typically ends the phase. And it appears to have been quite knowing and quite um, calculated in the way that it was done. Now, I don't want to disparage the player in question because I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, From the videos that we've seen, it certainly appears to me like, oh, you want to do that? No worries, mate. I'll help you measure it out and put models on the table. Oh, and by the way, that's the end of the phase. Knowing full well that that directly negatively impacted his opponent. Look, it did. But having said that, this is a big deal game. If someone's made a mistake and that's going to benefit you... But at the same time, there's other videos that follow on or actually precede that particular video that talk about the two of them going, we're going to play it casual, we're on a live stream, we're going to play it by intent. Look, you know that I cheat for the opponent when I play any kind of board game. I'm clearly not supposed to be in any kind of competitive event ever um, because, yeah, it's it's not my personality type to work that way. But when you played against, and I know that this is something that we're airing on Friday, so I shouldn't really talk about it, but when you played against G and in the um, game that you played and you made mistakes, both of you said, if this was happening at Masters, would I let you go back and replay that? Mm, not sure. Yeah. So you said yourself that you weren't sure whether or not you'd go back. So is the issue that somebody made a mistake or is it that it appears as though he's pushing him into it. I think that was the that was and the didn't thing. give him time to I kind of if, think it through. I think if if the player in question had stood back, let his opponent complete everything, and then gone to move something else and gone, nah, sorry, mate, that happened, and and kind of said no, I think that would have been okay. I think the fact that it was, hey, I'll help you do that, it felt like it was a premeditated, um, deliberate act to try and go, ha, huh, gotcha. And I think that's the bit that most of the internet objected to, myself included, because if if you want to if you want to win the LVO or any of the major events around the world, you want to do it. You you want to walk away cleanly, I suppose. In my opinion, I'd like to walk out of it if I won those events, going I I know that I played that as clean as I could. Yeah. And then, um, immediately- which is why when both you and G said that if you were playing this at Masters, you're not sure. I said to both of you, "Hmm, think you would have." So Yeah, but I mean, that video, when you watch it on Friday, you'll actually hear me say, oh, look, you know, I screwed that up. That's my fault. And I didn't expect her to let me go back. And she did. Yeah, but that's the thing. You didn't expect it. But if you were, play- if you were playing in Masters, you would say to somebody, no, you know what? You haven't done any of that particular thing. Go forward and do Oh, look, do there, it. there's only been a couple of times in my gaming tournament career that I've actually turned around and said, nah, sorry, champ, you can't do that. And that's when someone's done it to me first. First, yeah. Um, which I guess takes it to what happened in the next Yeah, round. because obviously the, the, the semi-final's over. The player in question who, who had that gotcha moment has won. He's gone into the grand final and then had that basically done back to him um, where he didn't declare something was happening. They were well past the phase when it should have been declared and his opponent went, oh, sorry, mate, if, if you hadn't done that to him in the last round, I might have allowed it, but... Um, you know, it's. But you did. So, I, you know, the, the internet again went wild over that because they thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. Um, I think the way that the player in question in the semi-finals, when that was done to him, handled himself, was fantastic because he didn't have a silk, he didn't have a, a tantrum. He went, "Yep, you know what? Fair enough. I made that mistake," and he played on. And um, you know, they, they finished the game, albeit only a couple of turns, because that's the other part of the problem at LVO was the slow play. Mm. But, um, you know, I think that, yeah, that, that, that whole sequence of semi final and grand final kind of tainted LVO's finale a little bit. Uh, 2018, most definitely. So, um, you know, I mean, 2017, when I was there, the, the, the final was only three turns in like the two and a half or three hours, which I think baffles so, me. As far as the 
kind of the bad taste that's been left in people's mouth, I think that the donations that have been made off the back of that yeah. have really made a difference to what people are now thinking about. Well, certainly what I'm thinking about the event anyway. Well, the so when Alex lost that semi-final game, one of the guys who was watching the live stream was a video game developer, one of the directors, and he basically got in touch with the guys at LVO and went, hey, I want to give Alex five grand as a sportsmanship award. And then Alex has basically just turned around and gone, nah, man, like give it to a children's hospital. Like I don't want, like I don't, you know, you don't need to give me five thousand dollars for behaving the way I should have. That's <laughs> it for behaving like a decent human being. And <laughs> then, on top of that, Alex has then managed to get his employer to donate five grand to the same hospital. Yeah. And then Games Workshop, I've seen, and they've donated five grand as well. Yeah. So which now means as a result of somebody behaving like you know just a, an adult, an adult, yeah. A children's hospital's got fifteen thousand dollars, which yeah. is fantastic. And hats off to Alex because, um, yeah, he's he, I'm ninety nine percent sure I'm thinking the right guy. He won LVO very at a very young age. He's always competed at the high end, and um, I, I think if he'd made it to the grand final, no one like would have been surprised. And I think that um, the 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 slow play combined with this particular incident has, you know, if, certainly for me it was disappointing. As a as a viewer, but um, you know, um, Nick um, certainly resolved that in the final when he went on to win it under a similar circumstances. So yeah, um, so that kind of follows back to all the sportsmanship and slow play stuff that we were talking about. We've tried a few different methods of sportsmanship scoring over the years. The one we do at the moment is essentially your favourite opponent and your second favourite opponent, um, which has its pros and cons I guess because some of them you end up in a situation where people get no points and then they don't necessarily they weren't necessarily bad sports they were just not the favorite games of the day and that's probably my biggest bugbear about it is that um, so we talked about the fact that all of the games have a maximum of 20 points that you can get so if you've got four games every day you can score a maximum of 80 points everyone can score a maximum of 80 points which is your um, that's your best general kind of score yeah. for the day but your best overall doesn't necessarily give you that same everybody's playing with the same number of potential points so we changed that with our painting scores because that was not necessary the way that we started was everyone got a painting score then we moved to peer judge painting and so people only got the points for the people who were voted for which didn't, um, work. Which didn't work because again it means that you've got some people who have got really wow looking armies so who will take um, a lot of the points just, that's it just by being eye-catching and then you've got other people who have painted their army to a really decent standard or a good standard but when you put a good standard next to somebody who stands out they're then missing out on potential points so that's dropping their overall score down and this is my argument with the sports score is that when you're voting only for your favorite opponent which generally gets three points and your second favorite opponent which gets one point you can potentially have a third of the room or more get no points. So you've got some of the room who are, you know, working on, let's say, 120 points maximum that they can get and other people in the room who are working on a maximum of 100. Well, they, they can so, still get those points, though. Like everyone has the same possibility of getting those points, but you... Yeah, but it's... Yes, they do. I get what you mean, but the people who don't necessarily get voted for, it doesn't mean that they're not a good sport. No. It just means that they weren't the standout. Yeah, and look, I mean, um, uh, I've, I've helped um, when, when uh, Luke Ritalik uh, and I and um, JJ Layfield way back when decided to launch Ultimates, which was the late 2000s, we had a format that included a sports box. And essentially, it was a, a, a five-question thing which said, yes, no, and maybe. Did your opponent do this, 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 and this? And they were all yes, no, maybe answers. And if you ticked maybe, they got half a point. If, they, if you ticked yes, they got one point for each of those five questions. And then there was a second, um, a second space on there that basically let you give them a score from, one to, uh, from zero to five, including 0.5 increments for their deportment and behavior and you know how fun the game was and that sort of thing so you had a tick box and you had a score the problem with that is that inevitably what happens is 
people just go, yes, 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 five, and then hand the card in. Oh, which means no, 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 two. No, never happened. No. Huh. It was or it, like when you got to the end of it, your sportsmanship scores, you'd have six games, 10 points a game, and you'd have 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 59, 59, 59. Like it was ridiculous. There was never any any variation in the points because people would just go, oh, yeah, that was fine. Tick, 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 tick. And the players who were ever actually conscious of that, particularly the check boxes, there were five questions. And if you ever thought about it and went, oh, you know what? Did you do it all the time? No. So that's a maybe. Did it sometimes, but not always. Maybe, 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 maybe. You would skew the data. The problem with that, of course, is that if some people are doing it the right way and actually scoring it accurately and others aren't, all you're doing is hurting some of the players overall scores because there are people who are being judged fairly and there are people who are just being judged like everyone else where it's just, yeah, yes, 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 yes. See, here's where we disagree. I give you guys a lot more credit than Michael does. He seems to think that you guys would just do what happened in Ultimates and you'll just give everyone 10 out of 10. I think if we go through and explain and do one of these videos and explain to people how to actually score it, maybe we will see that work successfully. So feel free to let me know. Do you think that if we explained how to score it, that that system could work? Or do you have a different suggestion for a different way that we can do sports? Yeah, look, I mean, there's ultimately there's the way we do it now, there's that sort of checkbox, yes, no, score out of five or ten or whatever it happens to be. Or there's the, the red card, yellow card system. They're kind I'm of not the, doing that one. Don't write on that one. They're kind of the three ways of doing it. I mean, I've, I've had um, one of the guys who came to our AOS event a couple of weeks ago basically say, hey, why don't we do a, uh, a flat, everyone gets a flat score and then you give one person at the end of the day one point and you can take one person's, like you can take one point away from one person as well. The problem with that, of course, is that you, know, you end up in the same situation we're in now where you're still voting for your favorite opponent. Yeah. Um, he even suggested taking sportsmanship out of the overall score. We have talked about that. Which isn't a terrible idea. Except my argument for that is that best overall is about the hobbyist. And the hobby is not just about winning games. It's about winning games. It's about painting. And it's about being a good sports. So if you take sportsmen out of that, then you really, it's already really heavily weighted towards winning games. And I get that that's obviously a big part of the hobby. But there's more to the hobby than just winning games. I think you've just missed the biggest problem with taking it out of the overall score. Feel free to share. Um, if you take it out of the overall score, there is no incentive for to people actually... to behave. Oh, see, I just think, okay, I mean, then most... I'm giving people more credit. Most... I think that people would oh, behave no, most, because like most they're of the decent play... people. Yeah, and that, that's exactly right. The guys who we do get along are, generally speaking, fantastic. But as soon as you remove that inhibitor, you, you know, it, it, like... Um, the best example I can think of is WATC. People are more happy to argue rules semantics and, um, you know, really fight for the way they read rules at WATC than any other event in the year because there's no penalty. Like there's no. Uh, see, I don't. I wouldn't have seen it that way. I see it that people are more likely to argue for the rules, and I guess that this is my personality coming out. I would be more likely to argue for the rules and to play to win in a team event than I would for an individual event because I have six play well five other players, the responsibility of them on my shoulders. Whereas if I'm just playing with, for myself, then I'll cheat for the opponent. Yeah. So but... that's why I think that people are more likely to argue for the rules for WATC because I you know, I need to carry I need to pull my weight. I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing for my team. I don't want to let my team down. So I need to make sure that I'm sure that I'm sure that people will view it altruistically like that. The problem is though that the cynical part of me goes, the only reason you're willing to stand up and fight about it now, if we were playing one on one, you'd never say that to my face because you'd be worried about me just going, nah, there's your zero for sports. Whereas in a team environment, I'm fighting for my team, I'm fighting the good fight. I'm defending what we need to have happen because we're we're you know, we're right and we this is my team. And there's no score So you think there. it's more of a mob mentality? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so um, the guys from Ozhammer, Brindley and Ryan, who are really lovely guys, they said that when they speak to Michael and I, they, they kind of think of it that they're speaking to one person and we're just sort of two halves of the one person. So I'm the positive person that sees the best in people. <laughs> Michael's I'm, the cynical I'm, I'm bastard. I'm the cynical old bastard, yeah. <laughs> thinks the worst of people. So um, I'm going to stick with my view. 
I prefer that view of the world. <laughs> I'm going to try my hardest to pull you to my side. Yeah, well, I look, it, like, I'm trying for 19 years so far. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've to... made a positive shift. Well, if you hadn't, I'd imagine what these poor bastards would be like playing it at events I was running now. Oh, God. I don't, I, You're welcome. Yeah. Um, no, look, we we might even try the, um, the the modified sports scoring. Maybe I can do it down in Albany. No, because they'll all be drunk. Not that you have to drink. Um, it's a good idea, though. You know, we could do it at Albany, or we've got our mid-year mixed gaming day. We might do a little forty k one and try it out in yeah. four or five different game systems on the one day and see what happens. I think we need to explain how to use the score sheet. And if we explain it well and people actually listen, because when I, when I explain things at events, nobody does listen to me at all. I can go around to people and literally walk them through a score sheet yeah. and have them come up at the end and go, I didn't get a score sheet. You remember when we had that conversation? You remember when I said this? No. So. See, at that point, if we were doing like a score out of 10 with like a card that you went, oh, okay, here's, here's how I get to my score, then you might even be able to do it in best case pairings. You'd set it up as like a um, a battle point only thing, but that would then expose what your sports scores were. Yeah. And sports scores, when you know what your opponent scored, you can also leave bad taste in your mouth. It's a bit like painting. It's one of the reasons why we don't... That's why we don't publish those. Publish those painting results because the amount of people that got upset and aggressive and That was more with clear judged. No, not even... Well, it was all the time because ultimately... It's uh, subjective. Yeah. So, and it's the same with sportsmanship. Yeah. Um, I can't see any comments on here, by the way. Do you want to try and scroll? Well, it means I have to lean over there and you've got the iPad right there. Yeah, I'm working on something else. Um, Okay, yeah. Keep talking. So, yeah, sportsmanship, that's a thing. And it's um it's not one that's easily resolved at the moment. It's something that who knows. It's gonna start talking. That's uh, all right. Go away. Okay, I can't see scores. That's I fine. I can't see comments. That's fine. Oh God, make it go away. <laughs> How do you make it stop? And this is and this is why I do the technology thing. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my world, everyone. So. Um, I actually think that might cover it for tonight, though, because we've been we've been talking now just under an hour. I just want to finish. There were a couple of points in that question you saw that I wanted to just over. You know, you have to hold the microphone to your face. I'm to you. Well, they can still hear you. There's a couple of things in that question that I wanted to go over, and I just need to find the question because I got rid of it to look for comments, like you asked me to, and now I've lost everything. See how I turn that around? It's all your fault. Okay. No one other is surprised by that. Um, is there an emotional level of perhaps losing a game and being in the mindset of, I didn't really like that player? Absolutely. Do you think? Yes. I have actually, when I've been talking to players, I've experienced the complete opposite. And I think it depends on it's the a game. Person, it's a game and a personality thing. Because if you've had a terrible game with someone who you don't gel with well, yep, and then you lose on top of that, and you've had fights over rules, and you've had you know, disagreements over line of sight and all the other stuff, you can walk away from that table going, you giant jackass. But you can win the same game and still walk away with that. Yeah. Whereas you can lose a game against someone and you can have a really good game and it can be a really positive experience even though you lost. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, I played Alan at Crags on the weekend. And he hasn't stopped sulking about it. (laughs) Just letting you know. Oh, look, I've joined. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Um, and uh, I, so I lost game three and four, uh, game three to Alan, game four to Ben. Both games were really enjoyable and I wouldn't have marked either of them down for sports because the guys I was talking to while I'm playing, we were both on the same page. We were really cool. Like, there was one point there where Alan's gone, oh, I can see that. And I've gone, oh, bullshit, Alan. And we've gone down. And he's gone, oh, see, from the tip of this wing here, I can see down there. And I've really? gone. Really? How many eyes have you got on the tip of your Alan. wing? Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> And Alan's gone, oh, it's the rules. I'm used to playing it with Courtney like that. So he did blame Courtney for it. Um, but it, what it meant is later in the, like, it was it was done, like, you know, it's in the rules. It's completely fine. It was nothing, like, I just went, oh, come on. Like, really? And then later in the, the turn, he pointed out that the, the same thing, like, there's this tiny little wing tip out from behind the terrain. And I've gone, I'm shooting that. And um, he's gone, yeah, fair cop. So there was never any negative 
feeling there, but it was one of those ones where he go, oh, come on, man. Like, really? We're going to play it like that? And he's going, yep. And I went, okay, fair enough. It's like, we know what we're doing. Yeah, but and that's and, what I'm, I think that you can have really good games and still lose them. And I oh, think yeah. that I often see in events, people will choose their favorite opponent as someone who they lost to. Yeah, that does happen a fair bit. I mean, the, um, the when I lost the game four to Ben, part of that, it was his first tournament. He'd never like played, well, yes, and played recently from what he was saying. And I deployed well and I treated it like a tournament game. And I was sort of going, okay, well, when you part, you have to do this because he was moving stuff out of sequence and wasn't doing it quite right. Um, lovely dude, though. So I don't begrudge losing that um, because we were both kind of that casual, it, it, you know, we were, were on the same page into what, in regards to the way that the game was going to be played. And I think that's, uh, that social contract is part of what's going to dictate yeah. um, how you rank people for sports. Because well, do you know what it is? It's people being good sport. Yeah. If you're a good sport and you win, you're still going to get marked as a good sport. If you're a good sport and you lose, but, you're going to be marked as a good sport. But that's one of the reasons why I like the format we've got at the moment because it removes any personality clashes. It was, what was my favorite game for the day? This one. Like, it doesn't matter whether you win or lost it. What was my favorite game that I played today? Oh, that was the other option that we had where you had to rank your games, favorite games from... Yeah, and that you just know, upsets people. Six oh, got... down to one and then... But at least everyone has the possibility of getting at least six points. All that does is create more bookkeeping for yeah, us. Yeah, no, it really does. It's a giant pain in the butt. But I'm just saying, we did have that other option and we're not doing it anymore. Um, yeah, Jeremy's just said um, you have to have some soft scores. We've tried events without them and the stuff can get pretty nasty pretty quickly as soon as people don't feel like they need to be nice. Now, Jeremy's... Um, first of all, what are you doing up at 1am, dude? You're in Victoria. Um, second of all... One end, 12 o'clock. Uh, three hours in front and start savings. No idea. Um, you know, part of that is he's, he's, and what he's talking about there is what I've seen over the years in terms of experience is as soon as people feel like they don't have to police some of their behavior, you do start getting some people behaving a bit more rashly and a bit more um, less socially acceptable. Let's put it that way. I, I don't know. For me, I will choose to believe the best of people and I think that I would like to see the sport stay in there because I think that it's part of the hobby. Yeah, And that absolutely. best overall is a score for the overall hobby, not just the yeah, who uh, wins uh, the most points. Therefore, that's why it's important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but one of the other questions is, I heard more than one people say they're going to an event to try and win sportsmanship. Can you do that? Is that an aim that can be achieved? Has been achieved. Oh, well, yeah. There, there's been people that have... Um, like uh, the AOS event recently, we had someone get a perfect score for sports, got all five best game votes. Having said that, he's really not the kind of guy that goes, oh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to win best sports. You haven't met the dude. Okay, it's not who I thought it was. No. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, dear. Well done. Yeah, I've that gone was, with that. Um... That was great. <laughs> Moving on. Um. I'm sure I have met him, but it's not You're who up, I thought it was. Jeremy says he agrees with both of us. He's up doing some marking. At 1 a.m., dude, seriously go to bed. You've got to be up yeah. in a few hours. That principal just dropped it at her desk. Make sure you're looking after yourself and work-life balance. Hopefully we'll, hopefully you can meet Jeremy in um, September for ATC. That will be lovely. Yeah. Uh, so is it possible? Um, it is possible, but with the current system we've got, it's not as easy as it could be. I think going to win sports, um, it's... Ultimately, it's going to be determined by who you play. And if you click with everyone you play and you have a laugh and you have fun and it's all jovial and stuff, the chances of you winning sports are very high. But if your matchup process, you either get someone who you, you, know, you disagree with on a personality level, let alone across the table, or you um, get someone who might be a bit more reserved and a bit more shy and you're very boisterous, that might come across as you being like loud and pushy, which means that you might not get that vote. I think there's way too many personality variables to say, I'm going to go and win sports. I, I just don't think, if you've got a room of 80 players, the chances of you being able to go, yep, I'm going to get five or six games that are guaranteed to be people that I like, you just it just doesn't happen. I don't know that you have to like the person in order to be a good sport. No, but some people vote that way, and you know how. And that's why I'm saying, with the current system, it's not necessarily 
that easy. But I think if we did move to a checklist, then it would make it a more achievable goal. Just means more bloody bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. I'm the person who does most of the bookkeeping and I think that Not we should try Not for the last two it. events. You can do it for the next one then if we're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, so, and then the last question about that is the slow player LVO. Slow play is a hard one to police and, I mean, I, I, we've only got, we'll wrap it up in five minutes so I'll try and yeah. keep it to five minutes so we can all go to bed, um, Jeremy included. Um, slow play... As as is mentioned with LVO in the semi final, um, the first guy took an hour for his first turn. The army had fifty ish models in it. Uh, several of them were vehicles. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take an hour to resolve your first turn. Not not with that sort of army. No, yeah, that's we had um, Owen who was running an orc army at Masters. So we we're playing twenty two fifty at Masters. He had two hundred and sixty models. It was a full infantry orc army. He was finishing five to six turns every game two hours 45 he was finishing games his brother in mixed doubles event was <laughs> struggling to, <laughs> but to my, get my through point, the first my turn point is that i if, know what your point is with, with yeah. owen when we were, i was talking to him it's like no i just played it and played it and played it and practiced it and practiced it and practiced it um uh, you know that's the that's the point if you're going to bring an army that's 260 models you better be able to play it out to five turns in that time frame yeah. and so when i see players who are getting to turn two or turn three in nearly three hours mm. i have to just shake my head and go what is going on yeah because either you don't know what you're doing or you do know deliberate. what you're doing and you're deliberately yeah. playing slow. i mean we had two hours on the weekend at, at crags game one game one we got to turn six game ended naturally Game two, we hit turn five, and we uh, about ten minutes to go, and we agreed not to play turn six. We wouldn't have made any difference anyway. Um, game three with Al, we played turn six, and then the game ended, which was great for me because I only had one model left. And game four, we hit turn five, and we agreed that the end was turn five. That's just Zane complaining about Elio. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to work out who he was talking about. Um, so, you know, I got five turns at 1,500 points in two hours with an army I had never used before, before that day. I had literally not put it ever on the I table. No, but really, you shouldn't be talking about that because we encourage people to practice with their models and I know what do they're some, doing. I wanted to do something different, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that if I, I can go point. along with an army I've never played before, I've n like never in my 40K career have I used Tau, not once. Mm hmm. And I took it to a tournament and I finished all of my games at least five turns in two hours at 1,500 points, including the time spent looking up stats and all the rest of it. And then trying to figure Someone out Someone could organize a medal for him. That'd be great. <laughs> I'll organize my own since I do with the rest of them. Anyway, um, there's no reason why if you're preparing for a major event and you've written an army list and you've submitted it early and all the rest of it, if you haven't put it on the table and you can't finish five turns comfortably that's on you yeah and it's something that we've talked about whether or not um because the war machine guys they use the chess clock yeah and, and, that, they, and that's a big thing in the moment in the american community is going to a chess clock format yeah and it's something that we talked about after the last war machine event that we hosted was wondering how that would work in 40k if we ran an event a two-hour event each player gets an with hour. The, with the death clock, yeah, with an hour per player. And once yeah. you lose your hour, then tough luck, sunshine. That's it. At the end of that hour, your opponent still, if they've still got 45 minutes of their hour left, they get to keep playing. Yeah, and they basically just do turn back to back to back to back to back yeah. and you just get to sit there and roll saves, essentially. And whether or not would that, um, you know, would that actually then discourage some of that slow play? Well, I'm imagining it would discourage some of the slow playing. Well, uh, how would that impact it? I think that... That's a good way of going if you have someone, like at the end of game one, someone comes up to you and says, hey, this guy's slow played me out. We only got two turns, rah, rah, rah. If it happens the second game, you might then go to them for the third and go, man, like seriously, now you're using a chess clock. Yeah. Um, and you'd start timing. You wouldn't necessarily go death clock straight away. You might even do it for game two and go, hey, man, two turns in two and a half hours wasn't great. Um, we want you to monitor how long you're playing. Yeah. And you might give it to both players to make sure that there's no discrepancy there. Um, you know, uh, the, um, the one of the things that we do for the, the games that we record here, and certainly the games I play casually, we still use the scoring app, the Obsex scoring app, which has got yeah. a chess clock in it. Yeah. 
And the best part about it is it lets you keep track of at the end of the game, when you, when you hit end game, it shows you the amount of time I used, the amount of time my opponent used, the total game time that we played and all the scores. So at the end of it, um, with G uh, for the game we just recorded, which I've just remembered, I've got to get that screenshot into the video. Um, I think we were in a two hour game. I think it was um, one hour and one minute for me and 59 minutes for her. I think you actually had an extra 10 minutes. No, it wasn't that much. I thought it was based on, I can't remember what it was based on, but anyway. Either way, my point is that... It was pretty close. It was within 10 minutes. No no one would argue with that. It's when one player has half an hour and the other player has two hours that you start going, really? Like, um, it doesn't take that long. And I think part of it's to do with people not being used to playing to a time limit. So if you start playing casual games, tell your opponent, hey, man, we're going to play this in two and a half hours. Set a timer and stick to it. And that'll ultimately make you faster. I think one of the reasons I got better at timekeeping for my games was um, when Brett and I, a good friend of mine, Brett, um, we were playing every week. We knew that we had from 7.30 through to about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and we tried to get two games in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had to be fast because we knew... Because then they had to stand outside on the lawn and talk for two and a half hours, so oh, they needed yeah, to... Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, like if you start monitoring your own player behavior with the same army again and again and again you'll start going okay cool first of all it'll make you quicker because you'll know what your army does you'll know what stratagems you have you'll know how things interact but also you'll get used to playing to to time limits Mm. and i think that's one of the biggest hurdles for anyone entering tournaments is not being used to playing to time yeah yeah definitely so um, slow play though, if you, if you ever feel like you're being slow played deliberately, and we've had a, a couple of people come and say to us at Masters last year, hey, can you come over and sort this out? Um, I'm happy to come over to the table and just kind of give everyone a gentle nudge. Um, don't feel like you have to um, be a jerk about it. Hmm. Just sort of come over and say, hey, like it's been an hour now, he's only just finished deploying. Um, and then I'll come over and I'll have a conversation with the other player because we don't want anyone to feel like they're deliberately being held at gunpoint for what's meant to be a hobby. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be a game. Um, Jeremy, well, it is a game. Jeremy, while doing his marking, says chess clocks are probably the answer for competitive com- context, but I think casual players wouldn't like it. For ATC Masters, it's fine, but for big community events like Terracon, I think chess clocks would uh, upset a lot of people. I agree with him. I think the tone of the event is... Like, Terracon's not a Masters event. Mm-hmm. It's a fun, community-driven event. And I think as long as you're kind of policing the timing and making sure that everyone's not being a jerk, there's not necessarily a need for chess clocks. Look, I hope that there's never a need for chess clocks. It's it's a very serious possibility, at least at some events in the States. Mm. Um, I would like to hope that it doesn't become a norm at ours. Yeah, it, that's what I'm saying. It, I'm just saying that we it was something that we discussed. It's something that yeah. we've, we, we've talked about. But I don't ever want to get to a point where... So if it was something like the way that was done with War Machine, that was actually really fun. Watching, oh, watching the, the guys end at of the end their of their game. Yeah. Where, um, move, move, think, move. Dice, 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 dice. That's <laughs> get it. Get the chess clock. Your turn. And they've got like 10 seconds left and 47 seconds left. And it's like, can I get all this done? Oh, I'm out of time. Yeah. It was, it was really good fun watching it. And there was so but, much energy and so much... I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know the right words for it, but it was really engaging. Yeah, I think though that that community's always had them. Yeah. It's it's something that Death Clock was introduced by uh, Privateer Press as part of their official pack, and I think that the players are just so used to it now, and because it was deployed officially, mm. there was no argument with that. It was well, that's the that's the that's official we way do. we play tournaments, so yeah. that's the official way that we're going to play tournaments. Whereas 40k has over the years been Games Workshop driven, then community driven, then Games Workshop a little bit, then back to community. And then we've had a long stint where basically from fourth edition all the way through to present day, actually maybe not present day, maybe in the last 12 months, um, we've had the community driving that standard of tournaments. And now Games Workshop are kind of getting back into it and being more active and going to LVO and going to Adepticon and um, running their own GT events at Warhammer World and, um, you know, getting in touch with different community groups and being more active in that space. I think if they ever came out and said, hey, TOs, we're going to make your lives easy. Here's our official players' packs. Here's 10 different players' packs. 
all of them include a chess clock, I think the community as a group might rebel because it's something that's... It, yeah, look... I you know, it might just be conveniently of, ignored. The end of um, 40K games are a lot, and Age of Sigma games, they're a lot more relaxed than the end of some of the um, War Machine games. And, you know... That's partly you, due to the game system, I guess. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So... Um, I don't know. I've lost my train of thought. I can't concentrate anymore. It was something we threw around. So, yeah, look, the chess clock thing, we've got a couple of chess clocks. Um, so if everyone, everyone, ever anyone gets that sort of, um, you know, a couple of warnings, then we can probably start pulling them out and use them if need be. Or, you know, the app's available on iTunes if yeah, you've got like, an Apple phone. So Yeah, the iOS app's really, it's two ninety nine, and it's under iPhone. Yeah, so under objective secured, you can't miss it. So you know, if you're in, you know, if you do want to see how long is each player using that kind of thing, we yeah. do have quite a few players who use it at events. So. Yeah, and, and it's you know, um, at Masters, I had one of those players come up to me with the app running mm. and hand it to me and go, "Seriously, this is ridiculous." And the app showed like five minutes for the player in question that he'd handed me, and then nearly an hour. And I said, "What turn are you on?" And he said, "Oh, it's still his turn one." which meant that they that five minutes that the player in question had used was his deployment time. Yeah. And um, it meant that the other player had obviously been spending the last 40 minutes or so playing turn one, which... But if people are using the app regularly, it doesn't become, we're putting this on you. Yeah. You know, it's just something standard that people use and actually, hey, this doesn't I, feel I think right. As, I think as long as players... Like, there's nothing wrong. When, um, when uh, Sly Dave and I last played, the discrepancy in time was about... We played two two fifteen, I think it was, and he had like an hour and thirty minutes, hour and twenty minutes, hour and thirty minutes to my forty fifty minutes, and that didn't like during the game that didn't feel like he was slow playing me. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with having discrepancies in time. It's when someone stood there going, uh, mm, uh, mm. "I'm gonna no, mm. I'm gonna," and then just which comes you know, down to practice. Sometimes no, it does. Some, sometimes it's people deliberately being a bit obtuse. Um, you know. No, your army. <laughs> There's that cynical versus positive. Uh, Zane, right. Zane, very quickly. Oh, hang on. Here we go. We've got some comments. Zane says, pure codex event, kill the soup. Yeah, we do that for first blood, mate. You didn't turn up. I'm Where were you? I'm expecting you there at show, mate. And Jeremy, down to Albany? Jeremy says, what do you both think about reducing points? The convention is 2,000, but you've been running smaller limits. Yes, we have, Jeremy. We've done... We did a thousand at First Blood. We do fifteen hundred for WATC. So a thousand at First Blood is five games. That was a nightmare. That was such a heavy day. It was. It was the amount of time that the guys actually spent and girls spent playing was certainly no more than they would for a higher point game with less games but well, they, longer. They only had ninety minutes though for those rounds, and that yeah. was just that smashed us really badly. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of the players by the end of the day were knackered as well. Mm. Um, WATC is two hours at 1,500 points, mm -hmm. which the, the games that we've been playing, like the one that G and I play, which will be published on Friday, um, was a casual game. We still got through the full five turns in fifteen in two, two hours. Yep. And if we'd been playing competitively, you probably would have seen a bit of that sped up. There were times where we were just kind of, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, or what does that and do? Or what does that do? at the beginning where you yeah. stuffed up and, you know, then you went back and that yeah. took some time and you didn't know that army either. I'm noticing a pattern here. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm you broadening have to spend time. My, my army play styles. I think you should be demonstrating the importance of knowing the army that you play with. But Everyone anyway, knows that's... I play Eldar. It's fine. Um, so, no, definitely reducing the points is a viable possibility. The, I suppose the change from 7th to 8th when 1750, 1850 going to 2000 because of the way the points all moved about felt natural. Mm. But I also think that there's some merit in going, you know what? maybe we need to look at going back to 1750 or 1850. It'll change the way people build armies because you'll have less redundancy. You'll have to look at how your army performs on the table because you'll have less ability to lose units. Yeah. It'll make games faster. Um, the, the problem is, of course, that when you do that, like we had guys coming to Masters at 2250 with nearly three-hour games with five models. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose it affects the skew lists more than, than some of the other ones. But... Um, yeah, I definitely think there's merit in looking at reducing some of the points values. I mean, 
mixed doubles is traditionally 750 a player to, per player. Mm. So it's a 1500 point game in two hours. And the ones that will happen at show, there'll be, like I say, for, uh, last blood, which will be the five game ball buster again. And then we... we've be awesome for the last day. Yep. And then the other two one day events, we'll probably start dabbling with some of the new, the different formats to see what yeah. um, what we achieve for, for time limits and for some of the new codexes that come out as well, which will change things. And we've also been talking about whether or not we do run a um, like a fun event, not necessarily a tournament, but a fun event where, um, I'm sorry, it's, I've had a really long day and I can't find the right words. Um, what is it called where they've got, where your opponents have got different number of, they're not matched. Like you mean like different points values? Mm, yeah. Also, oh, we we tried the open play cards recently. And... See, I'll talk. He'll finish it. It's all good. <laughs> and there's um like sudden death um scoring mechanics when you don't have equal points, and um while not for a competitive tournament, for a fun no, day that fun could be day. really interesting. Yeah. Where both players bring you know maybe it's a thousand point army and a two thousand point army, and you roll off to see who's the underdog, and then you play with the sudden death mechanics, and that could be quite an interesting fun event to play. Um, I'm not sure how that kind of works out in the bigger scheme. I think that needs more thought and probably some playtesting to go into it as well. But can you excuse me to get more games? Here? Absolutely. You guys <laughs> yeah. can see we're still. Well, I've got one of my fat mats here because we have been playing games at home, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and we forgot it was Wednesday, and we're like, "Oh God, <laughs> quick, no, get the computer matches, on." It's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're playing. We're recording tonight on our gaming table. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I think. Definitely, there's an opportunity to reduce points. I know Al's just re- just said no. We need two to two and a half thousand points. The problem is, you I'm go, still fighting for the apocalypse game. So the problem with as you up the points, some armies scale really well and some don't. And this like uh, the um, the orc army that um, Owen brought was a great example of that. When you've got 260 boys at 2250, if we'd up that another 250 points, we just would have seen a 300 model army. And at that point, for those far ends of the spectrum, you have to up the time yeah. because the orcs don't scale any other way, mm-hmm. um, at the moment at least, until we get a codex. So at that point, you're going, cool, we need three-hour games, three and a quarter-hour games to yeah. allow those games to finish. But then you've got other guys who are turning up with five or six models, finishing the game in 30 minutes, going, what do I do for the next two and a half hours? Which is actually something we had to deal with at Masters. Yeah. So, I'm yeah. still late back from lunch. <laughs> yeah, they were. Um, so, no, I, I think... Um, we really need to move the computer closer. No, because then it shows up on the, the camera. That's Zane saying big boys play big points. Yeah, I don't necessarily know that's true, Zane. <laughs> um, when you've got an army painted and you're playing again, you let me know. And then we can then we can talk about that big boys, big toys, big points thing. Yeah? I'm working on it, okay? Um, we're going to get this apocalypse <laughs> game happening. I just want him to start playing again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah. There's definitely, yeah, there's all my laughs. <laughs> There's no cranky faces. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's, um, thank you, Zane. That was him. Uh, anyway, look, I think we've um, we've covered a bunch of stuff tonight. If you are watching this post-event or post-recording, feel free to comment and everything or leave us some thoughts about what you think about sports scoring. Yeah, well, I am really interested in what people's thoughts are with sports scoring. Um, as I said, we had four different options. One is what we do at the moment where you vote for your favourite player and your second favourite player. The second option was something that we tried in the past, which was an absolute nightmare where you ranked your players over the day or the whole weekend with, you know, favourite player down to least favourite player. And so you got six points, five points, four points, three points, two points. We're not doing point. that again. Um, we'll try the checklist. Yeah, the, there was the checklist option and then the red card, yellow card, which we're also not trying. But if you have a fifth option, we're definitely open to hearing it. Definitely. Let me know what you think about whether or not, um, particularly if you're a WA player and you come to our events, do you think that the WA players would actually be able to use that sports checklist? Or do you think that Michael's right and we would actually get <laughs> everyone ending up with you know, pretty much 100%? I really don't like it when Michael's right. It does happen very occasionally. Um, and, yeah, what kind of things do you think that we should be asking on that checklist? Yeah. Oh, look, and while we've got you as well, um, if you want to give us feedback on the audio from tonight, I think I finally got it all sorted for these live casts because I've kept the headphones on all night just to keep track of what it sounds like and it sounds okay to me. But... Um, if you're watching this, let us know how it all sounds and how the video looks and 
Um, we'll be back next Tuesday to do this again. You've got Today's Wednesday. Wednesday. And we'll actually be back in a fortnight because next Wednesday the podcast goes out. Oh, that's out. right. So she's, this, she's on to it. It's fine. Yeah, this Friday. So this Friday's YouTube the release for Battle the, Report yeah, goes the first out. game with Galen. Next um, Wednesday's the podcast, which we haven't even thought about what the content's going to be. If you've got any suggestions, let us know. And then the following Wednesday is another one of these. Yeah, which... so we, we do these fortnight, fortnightly on a Wednesday. Feel free to send us through topics either via PM or just post them on the um, on the Objective Skill page or on the Obset Gamers group as well. We will find them and um, we'll chat about them. And you're welcome to join in on, you know, live. Um, thank you very much, Jeremy. Audio, audio is fine. Good night, y'all. Well, man, right. get some sleep because it's nearly 2 a.m. for you now, man. So... Um, Thanks for joining us, though. We appreciate it. And Zane and Alan have said that it sounds good. And thanks to finally getting NBN. We haven't cut out at all no. either, so that's exciting. No, we've, we've actually got a half-decent bandwidth now, which seems to be streaming well. Yep. All right. I need to get some sleep too. Yep. Thanks very much again for joining us, guys. We hope you've um, gotten something out of the conversation. And, um, yeah, look out for the uh, YouTube on Friday. Assuming, this Friday. This Friday, assuming the Friday. NBN holds up. All right. Take care. See you, guys. if I can figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> yeah, this is why he's in charge.